Welcome back to this course on advanced memory hierarchy design. The topic of this lesson is increasing cache bandwidth. The source of this lesson is chapter 2, in particular section 2.2 of the textbook Computer Architecture, a Quantitative Approach. The first technique to increase the cache bandwidth is to pipeline cache accesses. By pipelining cache accesses, we can have a fast cycle time or, equivalently, a high frequency, but the latency of a cache access will be multiple clock cycles. Here's one example of pipeline cache access. In the first stage, clock cycle, the address is generated. In the second stage, the TLB is read and the address is translated. Finally, in the third stage, the tags are compared and the data is transferred to the CPU. Pipeline cache accesses is quite common, as this example shows. In the Pentium introduced in the mid-90s, a cache access took one clock cycle. Beginning with the Pentium Pro to the Pentium 3, introduced in 2000, it took two clock cycles. And in the Pentium 4, which became available in 2000, and in the current i7, it takes four clock cycles. The ARM Cortex-A9 also has a pipeline cache access of three clock cycles. The advantage of pipeline cache access is that a higher frequency and a higher cache bandwidth can be achieved. It also allows higher associativity since the cache access is no longer on the critical path of the processor. A disadvantage is, however, that the branch penalty increases, so cache accesses should not take too many cycles. The second technique to increase cache bandwidth is to employ a multi-banked cache. In this technique, the cache is divided into several independent banks that can be accessed simultaneously. Obviously, this technique works best when the accesses are spread across the banks. A simple mapping that works well is called sequential interleaving or simply interleaving. In this mapping, the first block is mapped onto the first bank, the second block is mapped onto the second bank, and so on, until we reach the last bank and the next block will be mapped to the first bank again. In other words, as this example shows, when there are four banks, bank 0 contains all the blocks whose address C is modulo 4 equals 0, bank 1 all blocks whose address C is modulo 4 equal 1, and so on. Multi-bank multi caches to increase cache bandwidth are quite common. For example, the level 1 cache of the core i7 has 4 banks and its level 2 cache has 8 banks. The third technique to increase cache bandwidth is non-blocking caches. Non-blocking caches are based on the observation that out-of-order cores do not have to stall on a data cache miss. So a non-blocking, also called lockup free cache, allows the data cache to supply cache hits while a miss is being handled. The simplest scheme is called hit under miss, which allows the cache to supply hits during one miss. A more complex option is to allow several outstanding misses. This scheme is called hit under multiple, multiple miss or miss under miss. To explain the difference to a blocking cache, as well as the difference between the two schemes, this figure illustrates the timing diagram of a conventional blocking cache. First, the CPU computes, then it incurs a miss, then it stalls until the miss has been handled, and then it continues executing. If we allow hits under one miss, the timing diagram looks like this. The CPU incurs a miss, but continues executing while the miss is being handled. The data cache supplies several hits when, when, until a second miss occurs and then the CPU has to stall. So part of the miss penalty can be overlapped in this example. If we allow several outstanding misses, then the timing diagram looks like this. Again the CPU computes and then it incurs a miss. It does not stall because several misses can be outstanding. The cache supplies a hit and then there is a second miss. The CPU still does not have to stall because it allows several misses to be outstanding. 
the cast supplies another hit and then there is a third miss. Now there can be two reasons why the CPU has to stall at this point in time. Either all instructions in flight are waiting for their operands and there are no ready instructions to execute or the CPU or CAS controller has buffers only for two outstanding misses and therefore has to stall. I now want to sketch how non-blocking caches can be implemented. First, they re either require a full empty bit for every register or out of order execution. Full empty bits could support non-blocking caches in simple pipeline processes. If the next instruction reads registers whose full empty bits are set, it can, sim it can simply continue. If the full empty bit is cleared, then the processor has to stall. Second, non-blocking caches also require multi-banked or pipeline memories, since the memory system must be able to handle several requests simultaneously. Perhaps the biggest issue of supporting multiple misses is, however, that it significantly increases the complexity of the cache controller, since the cache controller has to keep track of several outstanding memory accesses. In particular, the implementation requires several miss status holding registers. I will explain the structure on the next slide. The miss status holding registers store information about outstanding meshes. In particular, each miss status holding register consists of the following fields. First, a bit indicating if it is free and can be reused for another miss or busy. Second, a field that indicates which block has missed and it's currently being requested in the memory system. In other words, the block address of that block. Furthermore, for each word in the block, the physical destination register where the word should be placed when it arrives. Then, on a miss, all miss status holding registers need to be searched in parallel to determine if the missing block has already been requested before. If it has, we do not want to request it again, but add the destination register to the list of destination registers. Finally, when the missing block returns from memory, all missed status holding registers are again searched in parallel to determine the one that requested it. Furthermore, the data words are forwarded to the right destination registers. On the next slide, I will show the effectiveness of non-blocking caches. Before I do so, however, I want to remark that the performance of non-blocking caches is difficult to evaluate because a miss does not necessarily stall the processor. In fact, out-of-order processors are capable of hiding a large part of the miss penalty of L1 data cache messes that hit in L2, but are not capable of hiding a significant fraction of the lower level cache misses. How many outstanding misses should be supported depends on several factors, in particular the temporal and spatial locality in the miss stream. If there is a lot of locality, most misses will be to the same cache blocks and a few miss status holding register will be sufficient. It also depends on the bandwidth of the memory or cache level that should respond. If it doesn't have a lot of bandwidth, then it does not make sense to support many outstanding misses. And finally, it also depends on the latency of the memory system. If the latency is long and the bandwidth is high, then it might make sense to support many outstanding misses. This figure shows the effectiveness of non-blocking caches when allowing one, the blue line, two, the red line, or 64, the green line outstanding misses. The memory system is modeled after the core i7 and is summarized in this table here at the top. This data is due to Li Chen, Brockman and Jupi and uses the SPEC 2006 benchmarks. The horizontal axis shows the different benchmarks and the vertical axis shows the relative cycles per instruction. The CPI achieved by a CPU with a non-blocking cache normalized to the CPI obtained by a CPU with a blocking cache. Note that lower CPI means higher performance. Allowing one outstanding miss 
improves performance by on average 7.1% for the spec in benchmarks and by on average 12.7% for the floating point benchmarks. Allowing a second outstanding miss improves performance on average by 8.4% for the integer benchmarks and by 16.2% for the spec floating point benchmarks. Hit under 64 misses, the green line results in little additional improvements, except for the floating point benchmark LBM. Finally, two exercises. The first question asks you to explain what misstatus, uh, misstatus holding registers are. The second question asks you to calculate how many outstanding misses we need to be able to support if the main memory access time is 36 nanoseconds and the memory system is capable of a sustained transfer rate of 16 gigabytes per second and the block size is 64 bytes. This completes this lesson. Thank you for watching. In the next lesson, I will describe compiler techniques to reduce the miss rate. Since compilers are often not capable of performing these techniques, you might have to apply these techniques manually yourself to improve, improve the performance of your code. Hope to see you back.